Hi, um, good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, um, organizers, for the kind invitations. It has been a very fruitful symposium so far. I've learned a lot. So um, my lab is in the Institute of Molecular and Cell Biology at ASTAR. Um, the university only remembers me when they need me to go and teach courses. So I'm also affiliated to the National University of Singapore. So the last time when I came to Korea, I thought I had aspiration to be an actor in maybe a Korean drama or something. So that, that didn't really work out, you know. Um, we are still missing a, a female actress wanting to start in the same drama as me. So I went back to the laboratory and be a scientist instead. So um, by, by now, I think it's very well understood that cell fate is very plastic, um, that cell types is never static. You know, cell can come uh, or, or can be turned into another cell types rather easily as long as you know how, you know, the kind of transcription factors that you add in, the kind of uh, genetic switches or epigenetic switches that you apply. And perhaps the most dramatic examples was the demonstrations that a fibroblast can be turned into iPS cells just by um, the mere uh, transfections or infections with four transcription factors of four SOX2, KLF4, and MIC, as pioneered by Shinya Yamanaka. Um, there is a lot of potential in terms of regenerative medicines uh, in the iPSCs or transdifferentiations technology. So, for example, you can make iPSCs and you can turn them into any desired cell types. And it's uh, well understood that they can be used for drug screening and disease modeling, and perhaps even in the future, as you have seen from. Uh, some of the talks um, earlier on that you could transplant them back into the patients either in the autologous or allogenic fa fashions. Well, the other route is obviously to be able to obtain primary cell and transdifferentiate them into the desired cell types as well. So when I first started to be interested in the reprogramming field, uh, that was when I was doing my postdoctoral fellowships with Professor George Daly at the Children's Hospital, uh, we realized that there are knowledge gaps. Well, the first was um, the easiest source of reprogramming cells. Um, we know that Shinya Yamanaka managed to show that skin cells can be reprogrammed, but uh, he did not really uh, try, or, or many of the other groups were, were, were still in the process of demonstrating that other cells can be reprogrammed. So uh, skin wasn't the easiest source of cells for reprogramming. So the other question was the heterogeneity mixed populations that you're dealing with, especially uh, during the intermediate stage of reprogramming. So that prevents you from trying to understand the mechanisms of reprogramming. So that wasn't helped by the lower efficiency of reprogramming. Typically for human, you get about 0.1% to 1%, which was very low. So let, let me just um, give you an overview of what I've done to solve two of these questions. The first one, trying to get an easier source of reprogramming cells. Well, um, for the clinician, it's not too difficult to do skin biopsies, but for the donors, it's not, uh, it's not a, a, a pleasant experience, especially if you're a healthy donor, right? So if you're a healthy donor, there's no reason why you want to donate a piece of skin just for research. And we think that because um, surgery and invasive biopsies means that they may uh, result in complications, it's difficult to get donors, and because the skins are exposed to the UV light, so perhaps they will harbor more genomic um, mutations. So uh, the first question that we asked ourselves was whether we could have an easier source of parental cells for reprogramming. Uh, what we did was to target the blood cells, and the first um, uh, soft source of the blood cells that we have obtained was a CD34 cells. So those were GSF mobilized uh, um, uh, progenitor cells that goes into the peripheral blood. So we found a way to sustain the uh, proliferations of these blood cells for about four days. So it's a mixture of the cocktail and by about day zero we infected them with retrovirus. By about day three to day four we kind of plated them on the feeder cells and we changed the media to human embryonic stem cells media. By about day 14 we get these cells to be uh, completely reprogrammed into iPS cells. Um, since we were able to reprogram the blood progenitor CD34 cells, we asked whether we can reprogram those progenitor cells from a bone marrow and from a cord blood. So what I'm showing here are the unpublished data, uh, where in the laboratory we managed to reprogram them. We got some of these um, uh, uh, do donors' um, uh, samples from hospitals, so and we managed to reprogram them. But there are a lot of disadvantages. If you look back, uh, we showed that we were able to reprogram mobilized peripheral blood. 
but mobilization would require the immobilizations with the GCSF, which is the injections of these cytokines into the body, so that the progenitor cells can come out from a bone marrow into the uh, peripheral blood. It is also therefore very difficult to get um, healthy donors to come forward to want to uh, offer their blood samples for reprogramming. Well, obviously, bone marrow extractions is again a very invasive kind of procedure, and cord blood is not applicable to uh, adults, especially if you have not banked your cord blood before. So the next questions that we asked was whether we can simply take blood from any adult individual and reprogram them. And we did that with the adult peripheral blood, straight away reprogramming them, and we reported dead studies. Um, surprisingly, we found that most of the cells which we reprogrammed were originated from the T cells. Uh, perhaps um, the protocol or the media conditions or the starting cell population contains a lot of T cells and they become very, uh, very proliferative. And uh, at the end of four to five days of um, expansions, we get a lot of T cells and we manage to reprogram them. So um, that was scientifically um, important because it addressed the questions on whether reprogramming can in fact turn back the clock on a terminally differentiated cells uh, in, the, um, uh, in the context of a T cells or B cells, we can test them because we can do uh, southern blot analysis to test for their rearrangement. Uh, so T cells will have TCR rearrangement and B cells will have rearrangement in the immunoglobulin. And the other applications of the ability to reprogram T cells was that you could actually make monoclonal uh, T cells like uh, iPS cells, uh, which can be very helpful because these T cells or these iPS cells can then be differentiated into T cells and they could be used for immunotherapy, something which we did not uh, uh, move into, uh, unfortunately, back then. So two other groups also showed that they managed to reprogram T cells. One was uh, Fukuda's group from Japan, and the other was Rudy Yenish group from uh, the Whitehead institutions. Um, well, because T cells contain T cell genomic rearrangement, uh, so as I said, they become monoclonal, suggesting that uh, if you uh, were to derive iPS cells from these cells and you want to differentiate them to say cardiac uh, cells or cardiomyocyte cells, uh, because a genomic rearrangement, you do not know what are the kind of implication it is, especially if you want to redifferentiate them into um, the hematopoietic uh, progenitor cells, for example, you wouldn't want these HSC cells to only give you a types of T cells. So there are implications. And we, are also faced, we were also faced with low efficiency of trying to reprogram the non-T cells. So we managed to reprogram some non-T cells where we did not detect any T cell receptor a rearrangement, but the efficiency was very low. Um, so the question was whether we can reprogram directly without um, uh, targeting the T cells. And we, we also asked whether we can reduce the amount of blood that we need for reprogramming. So when I came back to Singapore, uh, that was one of the first projects that uh, I've done. So the, that, that, that was me, somebody pricking my finger. So this is one drop of blood. So we got this one drop of blood into this tube that contains anticoagulants. And we asked whether we can reprogram simply by this one drop of blood. The advantage was you do not need a clinicians or phlebotomies to come in and take your venous blood and you can collect blood anytime, either in the laboratory or DIY somewhere else in a clean environment. So we showed that uh, one drop of blood is about 20 microliters. You just need 10 microliters for reprogramming. So we expanded the expansion uh, period to about 12 days with different mix of cytokines. Uh, we also changed the protocol to lyse the red blood cells. Uh, but about day 10 to day 15, you already see some cells that are settled down. So a change of lifestyle from their usual suspending single cell morphology. So by about day 20, you get iPSCs. And if you pick them and, and expand them, you get well-formed iPSCs colonies that can be cultured. Um, we did some staining analysis to validate uh, using OC4, which is a marker for pluripotency, TRA160 and SSCA4. So these are surface marker. Uh, for pluripotency. Uh, we did microarray analysis, so that was the iPSC line, and that was uh, peripheral blood from one of the donors. So you can see that uh, if you compare them uh, using this correlation plot, um, these markers such as Lennox, SOX2, OC4, and LIN28, these are pluripotency stem cell markers. They are uh, expressed um, highly in the iPS cells, but not in the parental cells. 
but if you compare the iPSCs and the human embryonic stem cells, you get uh, a very good correlation suggesting that the iPS cells molecularly behave like human embryonic stem cells. <coughs> we also have the switching on of pluripotency gene as well as the downregulations of the hematopoietic genes of several of our iPS line comparing to established human embryonic stem cell line. Um, we collaborated with Stuart Co from the National Heart Centre to differentiate them to cardiac myocytes. Um, so we showed that they are stains positive for alpha actinine, uh, MHC and titin. We also did some electrophysiology and they behave. Uh, obviously, we do not have the capacity or capabilities like Professor uh, Shiba to inject them into the primate, uh, but our collaborators are doing them are doing it. Uh, we do not, unfortunately, we do not have the liberty to share that piece of data here. So um, the ultimate visions of what we have done for the finger prick um, um, project was to be able to access the donors that are worldwide. So the donors do not even need to come to the hospital or the laboratory to donate their blood. You could send them a kit which contain the finger prick as well as the IRB approval consent forms and they can simply prick their fingers put it into the tube, put it on ice and send it to the laboratory within uh, two days and we can reprogram them. So as I said, we just need 10 microliters for reprogramming. One simple finger print is about 20 microliters. We can make use of other portions of the blood for genomic analysis. We can use them for serological analysis, etc. So we found that this will help us in establishing stem cell banking initiative worldwide. Well, um, to address the second question on so heterogeneity and mixed populations, we employ single-cell analysis. So um, what we did was to infect uh, these BJ cells, which is a fibroblast cell with OSKM, and we harvested about 1,300 reprogramming cells. Uh, we ran single-cell RNA-seq as well as single-cell ATAC-seq. Um, for my talk, I'm going to focus on single-cell ATAC-seq because I believe you will hear a lot about single-cell RNA-seq in many of the other conferences. So single-cell ATAC-seq allow you to identify regions of the chromatins which are accessible, uh, suggesting that they are regulatory elements. So uh, this is just one example of a day 16 reprogramming cells. Uh, it's positive because it was stain positive for trial 160. So these single cells stain positive for trial 160. And this is an example, screenshots of a uh, negative cell, so not stain for trial 160. So when the sequencing came back, we mapped it to the genome. Uh, this is one single cell of day 16 trial 160 positive. We found that the enrichment is around the TSS, the transcriptional star site. Uh, we also found that it behaves uh, in the sense that it gives us this very clear nucleosomal patterning, suggesting that the single cell ataxic work. Uh, we then did a very simple PCA analysis. So this is single cell ataxic, this is single cell RNA seq. So we harvested the cells from BJ, which is a parental fibroblast cells, day two reprogramming cells, day eight intermediate cells, and day 16 cells. We separated them to day 16 positive for trial 160 and 16 negative for trial 160. So immediately uh, when we did PC analysis, we found that the BJ cells are clustered uh, separately from the reprogramming cells, and day two cells seems to move away from the red color BJ cells. And uh, day 8 cell seems to be the most heterogeneous because day 8 cell seems to uh, jut a box between day 2 cells, uh, day 16 positive cells, some of them overlapping. And day 16 positive cells seems to be distinct from day 16 negative cells, suggesting that the positively reprogrammed cells are very different from those cells that are stuck in a non-reprogrammed state. So surprisingly, the single cell RNA seq kind of show us a, a, a a mirror of this um, uh, clustering profile. Uh, well, the other experiments or analysis that we have done was to map it to the DNA's hyposensitivity site that were published as a data set previously. So for example, BJ cells and H1 cells. So BJ cells um, were our parental cells. So when we map it, we found that many of the red cells that we have here are very much correlating with the DNA's hypersensitivity sites of the BJ cells, which makes sense. So we also have the H1 embryonic stem cells, and again, it's correlating with the H1 hypersensitivity sites. And it's interesting to see how day two cells are moving away from the BJ cells. And again, we see that the blue color cells, that will be the day eight cells, are very heterogeneous, 
So some of them behave like day two, some of them already behaving like the early reprogramming cells. So the, again, the day 16 cells are very close to the H1 cells, suggesting that they are on the right path to correct reprogramming. So uh, using these kind of analyses, you could visualize how the chromatin change as the cell become more and more like pluripotent stem cells. Well, the other way to look at this, uh, uh, or to make use of this data for analysis, is to look at bound site. So, for example, OC4 bound site. So, we know that OC4 is a transcription factor. So it binds on to different sites in the pluripotent stem cells. So, here, uh, each of these columns represent one single cell, and each of these rows represent a site where OC4 binds on to. And red color refers to opened chromatin, white color refers to closed chromatin. So we found that in the H1 embryonic stem cell, OC4 bound sites are accessible, so they are opened, most of them. So in the BJ parental cells, they are mostly closed. As reprogramming progress, more and more of these OC4 bound sites become more and more open because they are behaving more and more like pluripotent stem cells. So that kind of gives us confidence that our data makes sense. And the other way is to look at histone modification. So again, uh, these are H3K4 active uh, histone mark that are uh, specific to the embryonic stem cell. So we found that during reprogramming, these sites become progressively more and more open. Uh, we then want to find what could be the transcription factors that regulate closure and opening. So what we did was a very simple motif analysis focusing on sites that are open during reprogramming on one direction and sites that become closed during reprogramming. So those that are open in green here, so uh, we found that they are enriched by OC4, SOX2, TCF, and NANOC. So uh, again, it makes sense because these are the pluripotency markers. Uh, what really surprises us was the sites that are closed, so in grey here. They are highly enriched, very uh, high, uh, very significant p-value and full enrichment for FRA1 and June AP1. So they belong to the same complex, uh, which is why their motif looks very similar. So we found that uh, in the parental cells, they seem to be very highly enriched, but in or during reprogramming, they become uh, less and less enriched. So we went back to our ATAC data at a single cell level. Uh, we found that uh, these are enhancer regions that are, that are enriched for flower motif. Uh, we found that in the parental cells, they are very much accessible, they are open. And during reprogramming, they become progressively closed. Right. So again, the day 16 positive cells behave like the H1 embryonic stem cell. We then asked the questions if we could knock down FRA1, and we observed changes in the closure of the enhancer. So that was what we did. Uh, this is SINT, this is SI FRA1. We knocked down FRA1, we harvested the cell on day 8. So we found that when we knocked down FRA1, many of these sites become closed. Uh, which is expected because FRA1 is responsible for keeping these sites open. So, um, in fact, when we knock down FRA1, the, the chromatin accessibility is very close to day 16 positive, right? So, in terms of the uh, closure of the chromatin, suggesting that we kind of accelerate reprogramming if you knock down FRA1, and it also gives rise to lesser heterogeneity when you knock down FRA1. Um, so in terms of RNA-seq, uh, if you look at FRA1 expression, so each of these rows are single cell, uh, as well as its partner FRA2, we found that FRA1 is highly expressed in many of these cells, in the parental cells. Uh, on day 2 and day 8, uh, uh, FRA1 is still highly expressed, and by about day 16, especially the positive cells, it becomes kind of tapered off in terms of its expressions, and in the H1 embryonic stem cell, you typically do not detect uh, many cells expressing FRA1. So FRA2 seems to ma mirror that kind of um, expressions profile, except that FRA2 expression itself is kind of low. So we, we then ask if we can knock down FRA1 and uh, you know, perturb FRA1 FRA level and look at its effect on reprogramming. So what we did was to knock down FRA1 and FRA2, and we get a lot more reprogramming cells when we knock down FRA1, about 2.5 to 3 fold increase. Uh, when we overexpress FRA1, it kind of suppressed reprogramming suggesting that FRA1 serve as a barrier for the reprogramming experiments. Uh, we then want to look at what are some of the downstream targets of FRA1. Uh, we look at sites which are open and closed. We found that most of the sites are closed when you knock down FRA1. And most of these sites are associated with functions like actinomycin, BMP signaling and row signaling. So we want to look at what are the function of some of these um, uh, 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 GO groups. 
So um, we had a very good antibodies for FRA1. We did FRA1 chip qPCR. We found that FRA1 binds on to CNM1. When you knock down FRA1, it cannot abolish the binding. Uh, we also knocked down CNM1. We found that it kind of uh, mimic the level, the, the kind of effects of FRA1, and it kind of improved reprogramming as well. So CNM1 is a downstream target of FRA1 that needs to be uh, the needs the level needs to go down when reprogramming uh, takes place. So when we use these uh, recombinant forms of human BMP4, we added them to reprogramming. We found that it kind of uh, suppressed reprogramming. So again, that also established the um, kind of findings that BMP4 is a downstream target of FRA1. So in kind of a summary, we found that FRA1 regulates global and Hanso, and it has to be closed during reprogramming. So in fibroblast, FRA1 seems to occupy a lot of the enhancer region and keep it open. And many of these downstream sites are associated with functions like actinomycin, BMP signaling, and rho protein signaling. So during reprogramming, chromatin opens and closes, but the primary uh, mechanisms has to uh, do with the uh, lack of FRA1 or the down regulations of FRA1, which allow many of these uh, fibroblast-specific enhancer chromatin regions to close. And um, at the same time, NANO, OP4, and SOX2, the pluripotency factors were then assessed many of these pluripotent enhancer sites and keep them uh, open. And that would give us the IPSLs that we derived in the culture. So FRA1 doesn't bind onto the chromatin in a fully reprogrammed IPSs. So I just want to end by acknowledging uh, members of my lab. So the data that I've shown, Xiaore was the one who drove uh, many of these um, projects uh, along with colleagues like Delon. Shadi is our in-house bioinformatician. He did a lot of the analysis and the rest of the labs. Um, so Singapore is a very diverse place. Uh, we have groups from, um, with PI from all over the world. So within ASTAR itself, we collaborated with Fred. Uh, Yang Tai Cheng, I, I think he just left Singapore and went back to uh, Korea. So we are still collaborating uh, using some of his fluorescent dye to enrich for the intermediate reprogramming cell. Shigeki, uh, he's also part of ESTA, and our colleagues from uh, the universities and overseas. So as I said, Singapore is very diverse. In fact, these snapshots of my lab, I, uh, I was the only Singaporean. So the rest are uh, all over the world. So uh, I, I also thank our funding agencies and I thank you very much for your attention. So I'll be happy to take questions.